And good morning, everybody. Welcome to Orlando. We ran that twice because there's going to be a test afterward, and we didn't want the people who came in a little bit late to miss the first part of it. So, um, good morning. My name is Paul Kautza. <clears throat> for those who don't know me, I'm the director of education for TDWI. I'm the guy responsible for the, uh, selecting the classes and the instructors that you have this week, and would like to, uh, to hear from you, get feedback, and see how things are going with it. How many of you is this your first TDWI conference? Okay, now the rest of you that you're more than one, raise your hand and hold them up for a minute. So all those hands that are up, you guys should go seek those people out because this conference is a lot more than just the education side of it. It's the networking, it's getting to know your colleagues, and I can guarantee you that somebody in this room has probably solved the same problem you're trying to solve or has some of the same issues, and you guys through a networking process can work through some of that. So. Uh, use this week wisely because you have a lot of classes, but you also have a lot of networking time. Um, tonight there's going to be a hospitality suite at 7 p.m. Tomorrow night there'll be another hospitality suite at 7 p.m. So come and, and network and, and enjoy the, the free drink and, and food and get to know each other a little bit. Classes tomorrow morning start at um, 8 o'clock and breakfast is at 7.30 over in the atrium by registration. So that's the housekeeping. Um, I'm going to introduce our this morning's keynoters this morning. Uh, the first one is Mark Demarest. Mark is the CEO and principal of Numenol Inc., an international management consulting firm that works with buyers and sellers of information technology, biotechnology, nanotechnology, and clean green technology. Active in data warehousing and business intelligence since the early 90s, Mark speaks and writes, writes frequently on topics related to socio-technical socio aspects of com commercial decision making and has been a contributor at TWI events for the past five years. Mark Madsen, our other, the other keynote this morning, is president of Third Nature, a company that strives to fill the gap between what industry analyst firms cover and what IT needs. Mark specializes in analyzing technology, reviewing emerging technologies and markets while evaluating products independent of vendor market positions. Mark is an award-winning CTO and consultant whose work focuses on, analysts, on, on analysts, analysis and decision support systems and data infrastructure be, behind them. Mark uh, may not be qualified to make all the outlandish statements he might be making in this presentation, but he has assured me he's made just about every mistake you can make in this industry, so that alone should give him um, enough quali qualifications to do this. Uh, in addition to their uh, day jobs, um, I have hired them at TWI uh, to come up with a new show. You can see the show you just had there, but we have seen the same TV show in our industry repeated over and over and over for a lot of years, and I think it's time for a new one. So I hired these two guys to, uh, to pilot it today for us. So I give you Mark and Mark. After you. After me. Good morning, everybody. Those of you who have been here before know that Mark and I do the morning TV show, typically on the first day. And uh, Paul did tell us that our old show was stale and we needed to come up with a new one. So you are going to be exposed to the pilot episode of, uh, of our new show, The Shiny Objects Show. So I'd like all of you to cast your minds back to 1977. Some of you were no doubt in utero. Some of you were not even a gleam in your parents' eye yet. But those of you who are about my age will remember that 1977 was a beautiful year. Donna Summer was top of the music charts. We had just recovered from uh, the realization that a group of small countries, none of which we could locate in the Middle East, were capable of driving our economy into the ground. But if you were 13 years old, it was a great time to be alive. I was living in a small tobacco town in eastern North Carolina and I was madly in love with a girl named Gina Tyson. I've diligently searched Facebook and I can't find her, uh, but it, it, this is a Hollywood kind of scenario and Gina was in love with someone else, but I was convinced that all I had to do to win Gina's love was to give her something shiny. So I took all the money that I had earned from running my paper route, this was a time when children delivered papers on bicycles. Does anybody remember that? 
Now, now it's actually an occupation for adults. It's kind of an interesting marker for the transition in the American economy. But I took my money from my paper route and I went down to, let's see who can remember this one, the greatest store in every mall in America, Spencer's Gifts. Who remembers Spencer's? Raise your hand. Awesome. Every bit of silly junk you could possibly imagine and big cases full of shiny stuff. And I took my money and I bought Gina Tyson the biggest, shiniest thing I could find in Spencer's gift, which happened to be a necklace. And I kept it in my locker until lunchtime. And then out on the playground, I gave Gina Tyson the shiny thing. And she opened it and she put it on and there was immediately a crowd of 13 year olds around Gina to examine her shiny thing. And it was beautiful. All of a sudden, I was boy number one in Gina Tyson's universe. And that lasted until 2 o'clock in the afternoon <laughs> when I saw Gina Tyson in tears running down the hall to the girls' bathroom. And it was an hour or two later when I found out that that shiny object I had spent all that money on to win Gina Tyson's love that she had put on her neck had turned her skin green everywhere. I should have learned my lesson about shiny objects when I was 13 years old, but like so many of us, I didn't. And I grew up and I got into technology and I still was chasing those shiny objects, just like bowerbirds and magpies do. Anybody familiar with the behavior of these two species? Very interesting, bowerbirds like to collect things of particular colors. So when you find a bowerbird's nest, you'll find big piles of blue things and red things and green things that they've carefully collected and piled up in order to impress their mate. Magpies, on the other hand, just go for anything shiny at all. Now, we live in an era of technology that might be referred to as hypermarketeering. It's something like the economy of Zimbabwe. That's a hundred billion dollar note you are looking at there. It costs that much to get a cup of coffee in Zimbabwe these days. The world that we inhabit, the world that provides us with the technology that we are expected to deploy on behalf of our customers is a world full of shiny objects. And today, Mark and I are going to try and take you through not only some of the shiniest of those objects, uh, but also some of the basic principles for doing a decent job as business intelligence and data warehousing professionals in an era of shiny objects. And so I'm going to invoke the patron saint. Does anybody recognize who this is? Who does recognize this man? This is Mark Benioff, the CEO of Salesforce.com. He is the patron saint of shiny objects. He invented software-free software, and that's something. And for years, Mark has been telling us that it's all about social, social everything, and that what we need to do is move all of our data into his infrastructure so that we can participate in the social revolution. And then, of course, the social media companies go public and their stock drops and social isn't hot anymore. And so Mark has announced that social is out and what's in is the internet of customers. What does that mean? Well, someone actually asked him at the press conference where he announced this what that meant. What does the internet of customers mean a more collaborative, customer-friendly orientation? Or are you just selling software that enables your customers to sell their customers more things they don't really need? And because he's a saint, he answered the question honestly. Uh, it's the latter. We're into revenue maximization for our customers. Yes, we want to sell more stuff. Bring on the socialists. So with that, let's talk about shiny. The way you get shiny is you use adjectives. Shiny is an adjective, object is a noun. If you read all of the marketing literature out there, you find shiny, shiny, shiny object, shiny, shiny object, shiny object. So pick up your favorite BI marketing 
fact sheet from the vendor. Go to the websites and download the, those product sheets. And they will describe all sorts of things with these words right here uh, that we threw together on the screen. And there are, interestingly, two classes of adjectives in use, right? There are um, attributes, and then there are characteristics, right? An attribute is like a feature. You know, I have pie charts in Excel. Well, that's, a, that, that's just a simple attribute thing. So. But then there's the stuff that I find more interesting, which is the characteristic adjectives, like disruptive or innovative or open. Right? They, they describe something different. It's a characteristic that derives from how this thing is built and how it works. And disruptive is one of the most commonly bandied about in the era of big data that we've got going today. And that, that disruptive is misapplied because disruptive applies to a market. You disrupt markets. You don't disrupt a technology and you don't really disrupt with a technology except on very rare occasions, like the invention of the transistor. Transistors, you could argue, were disruptive. But things you build with transistors, not so much. They just create new replacements, this product for that product, or this is a new and improved that. New and improved being adjectives. And so mostly what you're talking about with the introduction of a new technology or an evolution of technology is destabilization. You are destabilizing the equilibrium between a number of components in a software ecosystem, for example, that are going to tip it one way or the other until it finds a new equilibrium. Unless, as in today's market, everything is disruptive, in which case the entire market is nothing but chaos, which is kind of where we are in the, in the software markets today. So when you're reading the hypermarketeering that Mark was talking about, you really have to think about what adjectives people are using and what nouns they're modifying with these adjectives. And trying to tease out whether this is a, a feature or an attribute you can just add, or whether this is a characteristic that derives from it. And I'd argue that most of the time, they're using the latter as the former, so that you can have my new BI tool, new and improved with privacy. Well, new and improved with privacy isn't gonna work. <laughs> Uh, new and improved with performance. A lot of people build software assuming you can have performance afterwards. We'll get that later. We just want to get the features right now. And if you've ever worked on any of this stuff, you know that doesn't work. It's like taking a very old car and trying to turbocharge it. Now, what we're really talking about in technology markets, in software, in, in data, it's that we're, we're building systems not with one technology, but with a whole host of them, right? A data warehouse, for example, is a bunch of moving parts. And they're layered on top of each other in ever receding distance. There's some sort of computer or operating system, which these days is completely virtualized. And so what we have is a pile of objects, some shiny and some not. And the thing is that the not stuff, like relational databases, is being superseded by things like Hadoop. And what we've forgotten is that you have to design and architect systems. And design and architecture means fit, form, and function. You're going to build stuff that's going to do certain things for people, and it needs to fit how they use that stuff. Hadoop is a great example of a labeled disruptive technology that is really just a very small improvement and in some ways a throwback to some things we did before, married to something that's slightly new. What is really intriguing about Hadoop is not any single technology, not even the MapReduce bit. It's the arrangement of the components. The disruption in the data warehouse market has nothing to do with specific technologies. It has to do with taking the parts that we've got, which have evolved in different directions, and rearranging them so that they work in a different way, which creates new emergent behaviors. That is the whole gist of how to be an architect, and what you're looking for is how to arrange different pieces to get different behaviors and functions out of a system. So with that, we're going to start launching into a few things. First so, of all, the objects that we've chosen to talk about today. Since it's really popular and Mark likes shiny <laughs> objects, we're going to go with actual objects first, the internet of 
things. Everybody's talking about IoT, or Mark Benioff talking about IOC, which was my favorite relabeling, because it's actually a more honest one, despite the fact that he's hidden it in marketees. It's really honest because your things try to use your credit card to get you to buy other things, or they just do it on your behalf. Then we've got cloud, and cloud applies universally. That's actually an adjective more than a noun, but uh, we've, we've adjectized, adjectivized the noun. Uh, decision management, everything has in memory today. Uh, my Cheerios have memory now. And data visualization and discovery, and then we'll sort of close out on some systemic things around privacy and security. So let's talk about the Internet of Things, the sensor revolution, the most fundamental hardware level disruption that we as technologists have experienced since the invention of the modern CPU. Sensor arrays everywhere. From a, a theoretical standpoint, this represents the culmination of the information technology revolution. We brought technology into corporations to count the money, and we allowed them to take over more and more and more and more of the functionality of counting and record keeping to the point where by the end of the 90s, relatively few decision makers were actually dealing with the business on the ground. They were dealing with an arithmetic database abstraction of that business, and we all contributed to that. That is what data warehousing is about, creating an organized set of data that allows decision makers to experience the business, but you know, at a relatively far remove. And now we're bringing it back, back to the ground, where everything, including everyone in this room, is going to be instrumented and emitting. All of the components of our personal lives, from our appliances, to our houses themselves, to our automobiles, are going to be instrumented. And our automobiles are going to be driven on highways that are instrumented. And this is a beautiful thing. This is the automated universe that we have all wanted. And finally, it's coming to pass. The goal of doing nothing more than to allow us to live our lives more efficiently and more effectively. And as the diagram indicates, there are hundreds of vendors and hundreds of billions of dollars of technology investment going into making this internet of things for us so that we can experience life as we were meant to experience it and focus on the things that really matter. Thanks, Mark. That sounds really great. I think I'd like some of the IoT. So if I'm going to buy that, I have a couple of questions. Uh, first off, um, you know, Benioff, when he was talking about toothbrushes reporting, say, toothbrushing habits across the, the Internet of Things, um, what happens when I throw my toothbrush away? Well, you, you get another better one. But, but the toothbrush is, like, at Goodwill now. It's an electric toothbrush. Um, and it's reporting my flossing habits to some computer somewhere, right? Because it's producing the data. Absolutely. You're... Who gets the data? Well, the toothbrush manufacturer. And, and when they have the data, what are they using it for? Uh, they want to improve the product to give you a better toothbrushing experience with the next generation of your electric toothbrush, of course. So what happens to all the old toothbrushes reporting my data? Well, I don't, I, we just we don't pay any attention to that. Oh. Who owns the data? The toothbrush manufacturer. But do I get access to it? What, did you not read the terms of service agreement in your toothbrush box? <laughs> but where do I click through on that? Well, you get a nice dashboard. We're going to give you a dashboard of your your brushing habits, like a dial of how many minutes a day you brush, and then there'll be like a, a nice needle gauge of some kind about your flossing habits. We're going to give you back the data in a way that you can understand it. Okay, so if I, if I want to use this technology to build into my products, I'm going to need a really big SAN. Yes, and, probably. Uh, a really high bandwidth network connection for all of these devices yes. and a Fiber. 4 by 7 website. Yes. Okay, that, that sounds cheap. <laughs> uh, hmm. 
I, I'm not really sure why I would want this stuff because it seems like it produces value for everybody but me. Yes, isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? How many of you have read the terms of service agreements for any of the major websites that you've signed up to? I mean, really read them. Raise your hands. Come Raise on. your hand. Come on. iTunes. Some, How many it. people have read the iTunes agreement? No, you just click through it, right? You just nope. want it. You want what's on the other side of the legal document, and you click through the piece of paper that says, we own the data. And the data is you, or attributes of you. So I've read the iTunes Terms of Service Agreement, and after reading it and having my hair stand on end, um, I pretty much stopped using iTunes except to load my iPod, which carries its own terms of service, if you didn't notice. And the next one, of course, will carry a sensor array that will track you around and geolocate you and determine when it is that you actually listen to that music. So let's talk about cloud. So cloud is one of these great things that's both a noun and an adjective. And cloud is this happy place. And it's a happy place because it's the place where you can go and deliver software and services to users or customers, and they'll stop being mad at you. Because everybody knows that your conventional data center and your change management practices and all the stuff that you do are the things that make IT suck so much for the business user. So everybody's rushing to cloud, and they're rushing to it, and the reason that it doesn't suck or makes IT suck less is, is, is kind of three or four things, right? Number one, instantaneous gratification. With Cloud BI or Cloud Database or really just a Cloud Data Warehouse, you can deploy instantaneously. Swipe a credit card, click through the terms of service, and you're up and running within the hour. Right? You can't get a pallet of physical goods delivered from a hardware manufacturer and installed in your data center in less than three or four weeks, if you're lucky. So you got instant, instant everything. And it's pay as you go because you're not buying hardware and you're not buying software and you're not buying all kinds of uh, stuff and having to go through all of these license negotiations and enterprise agreements with vendors. Anybody can buy this stuff. Instant gratification and pay as you go, right? Without having a huge upfront capital investment, the cloud enables you to just pay a little bit at a time and pay it as a service. It's like metered billing with electricity instead of having your own power generator. I mean, it's just obviously a good thing. And, and you know, cloud, as Google has shown us, is infinite scale and performance. Oh. So you can scale the heck out of your systems by just adding more cloud. Wow. That sounds like something I'd want. So let me ask you a few questions. I've got 55 terabytes of useful decision-making data inside my enterprise firewall. How do I get that into the cloud? FTP. FTP. Wow, that's pretty advanced. The last vendor I talked to said, write it to a USB hard drive and ship it to me. Okay, so let's pretend that I got my 55 terabytes into the cloud. Where is it? In the cloud. It's in the cloud. Got it, got it. So You don't if, have to worry about that. So if it's in, but, but I mean, it, it ultimately has to land someplace real. So when it's in, I don't know, Zimbabwe, and there is a geophysical event in Zimbabwe, what happens to my data? Well, it's typically for availability reasons, the cloud being highly available, we have copies of your data all over the place. Oh, awesome. So that way, if Zimbabwe has a problem with, say, hyperinflation and your data center gets pillaged, we have a copy of it right in neighboring Namibia. In, in Namibia? A very safe country? I'm, I'm comfortable with that. Uh, suppose that I want to move my data from your cloud to Paul's cloud. How do I do that? FTP. FTP, very nice. Now, what happens when you go out of business? 
Well, how would that happen? This is a growth market. We're growing at at least 100% CAGR per year. Is that per year? Yes. CAGR per be. year. It's CAGR. <laughs> yes, well, the cloud is a very shiny object these days. Everybody recognize that? Unfortunately, many of us created the shine inadvertently because, as Mark said, the, the real value proposition for the cloud ultimately is don't wait for those IT people to do a bad job. Get the right stuff now. And we all need to recognize that the cloud as an economic phenomenon is in a gigantic race to the bottom, right? Every month, the price for everything drops. You guys watching this? Who's sitting at the bottom of that market? Amazon. They were there from day one, like a giant ant lion just waiting for all of us to fall into their mouths. Right? Very risky proposition these days. So let's talk about decision management. You know, the market that we work in has been around conservatively since 1991, when Inman wrote the first version of building the data warehouse. So for 20 plus years, we have been operating in a market, the fundamental value proposition of which is that if you give people information, they will make more and better business decisions, and the companies we work for will consequently perform better in the market. That is what business intelligence is all about. And 20 years on, we can't prove that we've added any economic value. Yes, our users are happy. They have more data than they had five years ago, 10 years ago, but we're not performing any better in our markets than we were before, and despite the attempt of nearly every analyst organization to find systemic benefit from BI, it cannot be quantified. This is a problem. It's kind of our dirty little secret that we don't like to talk about. And the reason is we're not automating decision-making processes. We are gathering data, and we are dumping it on the desktops of decision makers in increasingly pretty forms, and we are saying to them, surely you must know what to do with this. And they don't. They make PowerPoint, they go to meetings, but the decisions don't get automated, they don't get instrumented. We don't know, fundamentally, whether the 16 people in our company responsible for making decisions associated with new product introduction make them the same way, use the same data, weight it in the same fashion. We don't know any of these things. So it's time to step up to the real problem, and the real problem is managing the decision itself, which starts with the delivery of data, and then takes, in some cases, days, weeks, or months to conclude, and the effects that it has on the business are yet further downstream from that. We have the technology. We certainly have the sensor arrays now to instrument our business in ways we never have before. It is time for us to step up to the big problem, and that's what decision management is all about automating the decision, measuring the outcome, improving the process. It's a manufacturing discipline. Who wouldn't want that? Who wouldn't want that? Buy some today. In fact, I'd like some of that, so I have a couple of questions. I'm surprised. Yeah, it seems so obvious. So you're saying automating decisions is the source of value. Yes. Kind of like when we automated all those OLTP systems back in the 70s. Exactly, exactly. So my point. we automated the paper workflows, and the value came by taking people's labor out of the equation and reducing the costs. Yes. So cost reduction and the bottom line. Yes. That's what decision management is all about. Yes. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take decisions like strategic decisions, like should we go into this new market sector or should we expand geographically and automate that decision? No, we can't automate those decisions. Uh, so what, what kind of decisions do we automate? Um, ones that don't really add 
all that much value to the business to begin with. So the small programmable decisions that we can draw a box around to, to sort of automate. Yes. Right, like, 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 like when you call an airline to try and get on a different flight. Yeah. And you end up pushing all of those buttons that go around in circles inside of a call tree. Before you get the screen that says, I'm sorry, you must talk to a customer support operator. Yeah, that one. Yeah, that one. Okay. So, so really what we're doing with decision management then is removing human judgment from workflows where humans make decisions and automating that. Now, if we do that, aren't we uh, essentially going to have to analyze the decisions that we're going to make so that we know in advance what the parameters of that decision are so that we can design the workflow for them. Yes. So these decision workflows typically can't have exceptions. We don't like exceptions. So we're going to automate the things which can already be programmed and we're going to spend how much for this kind of stuff? A uh, fair bit. Yeah. So. I'm having trouble figuring out if we've automated the minimum value decisions while leaving the complex stuff on the table, how we've done every, anything other than reduce a tiny slice of cost and left all of the opportunity piece on the table in what amounts to a race to the bottom of cost reduction instead of adding value. <laughs> this is a very complex shiny object. There is no doubt in the minds of people who look at decision making in the enterprise, not technology, decision making, that there are many decisions made by people that could be made more cost effectively by technology that do not require judgment. But there is a fundamental problem with decisions that do require judgment and it is this, they cannot be effectively automated. Judgment is not algorithmic, judgment is heuristic, and here is the other interesting problem with judgment in commercial decision making. No one person judges. Judgment is gregarious. We talk about it. I had expected for years that the social technology shiny object vendors were gonna stumble upon this problem and go, ah, I know what all this social technology is for. It's to help with group decision making. That's what we ought to be doing with all this crap we made. Did not happen. Very complex problem. And decision making is one of these problems where there are bounded decisions. They're not automated programmatic decisions that you could have a machine do, but there's also stuff you can draw a box around. Um, like, well, like, like loans, for example. There's a bunch of parameters around making a loan, and at the end of the day, a human makes it but the decision itself is repeatable. It's just that there are enough parameters that you can support it with a computer, but you can't automate it. And those things kind of work in a decision management context. Yep. But outside of those very common repeatable decisions for which you can analyze the parameters, decision management fundamentally leads you down that path. In memory, how many people have been exposed to the in-memory shiny objects in the recent past. I know you have. I know you have. Who, who's running SAP? Raise your hand. Should be a lot of you. Some of you are lying. In memory, as I said when I was talking about the Internet of Things, we've had a fundamental revolution in hardware technology. We have sensor arrays like we've never had before, and the other thing we have is awesome amounts of compute power and incredibly cheap memory. And this is going to allow us to solve a problem that we have been wrestling with in data warehousing as long as the two of us have been in the business, which is disks are slow, and every database management system on the planet is I.O. bound, is waiting on the disk to do something. Screw those disks. We're going to do it in memory. Load it in, run it at memory speed. Everybody gets everything right now. Instantaneous 
gratification. No matter how complex your query is, no matter how many joins there are involved, we're going to give it back to you at memory speed. It is going to be marvelous, miraculous. You're going to know right away. You're going to be able to make good decisions. We have got exabytes, potentially, of capacity in every modern system to load up that data and give it to you in memory. How could you not want that? That sounds great. That sounds like something I would want. Instantaneous, immediate hyperperformance. Yes. I love your slide. Thank you. Uh, I'm curious, so 64-bit so processors can address up to 16 exabytes of data. 16 exabytes, so big I can't even really and wrap an my exabyte head around. is 1,000 petabytes, and a petabyte's 1,000 terabytes? Yeah, I think that's right. We've had that 64-bit stuff since, like, what, the late Pentium era, right? Yeah. But when I look at the trajectory of memory inside systems, it hasn't really risen at that same level. Um, and, and the current Intel Xeon processors, according to this spec sheet, uh, they have a 46-bit or a 48-bit, I don't remember which, uh, um, address space. So surely that's not 16 exabytes. I don't know. It's, it's math. I'm just the marketing guy. Oh, OK. Well, maybe we can schedule a call with the engineering well, department well, well, I'll for get after engineer that. I'll get engineer to answer Because that would be helpful. Um, and uh, I noticed that you have one gigabyte of flash memory. Average price is $56. cents. Um, and, and I was just curious, uh, which is it? Is it $56 or is it 56 cents? Oh, I'm sorry. You are clearly not up on the latest industry terminology. It's $56 cents. It costs you 56 cents to buy the memory and $56 to actually install it. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Therefore, it is $56 cents. Is that trademarked? <laughs> it will be very soon. OK, thanks. Um, now, a couple more in-memory questions. According to these diagrams here, they're still um, you know, a, a kind of a disky thing on the side there. So if, if it's in memory and I first install the system, uh, where does data come to the memory from? Oh, well, that's what persistence. We have a persistence layer. Oh, persistence layers. Uh, uh, think of it, yeah, there's a persistence layer. Is that a cloud? No, no, no. Oh, it, okay. it, it could be in the cloud. It could be in the cloud because we could FTP the data. <laughs> I see. But no, but it's probably not in the cloud. But it's in your persistence layer. OK, so what is the persistence layer made of? Uh, EMC sand. Oh, OK, disks. Uh, yeah. Oh, OK. So, um, so if I get that exabyte of memory, I'll also need to have an exabyte of disk to go with it. You probably need to, now with, you know, shadow copies, redundant, maybe three exabytes. In oh, your, OK. Yeah, that, which, of course, is f much bigger than one SAN, so maybe there, there are a few SANs down there. OK. Um, so a petabyte of memory equals a petabyte of disk. And uh, I'm paying $56 for this stuff. Um, the emphasis is on the cents, $56 cents. Yes, dollar cents. Right. Thank you. Yes. Um, what about the, the BI tool? So that's the database layer. Now, we also have in-memory BI, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and and the, the data is going to reside inside the memory of a BI product, right? Yes. OK, so, so the thing that that runs on is going to be a memory. Now, as I understand it, if I run in the cloud, the cloud is basically a bunch of virtual machines, right? Yep. So. How come it's not super fast by taking this physical server running my BI software and sticking it into a VM? Because isn't a VM then entirely in memory? Well, maybe. But you have that problem that it's, there's your VM, and then there's your neighbor's VM. Oh, And then right. his neighbor's VM. You know, so it's I've like, got neighbors now. Yeah, it's like an apartment complex, right? And you have an apartment, but the guy next door likes to listen to music very loud late at night, and there's really not much you can do about that. Gotcha. So if 
I've got to get memory from some place into my BI tool before I can act on it. That's the point where I'm going to get the performance, right? Right. So BI tool, in memory, lots of performance, got to get the data there first. It sounds like a query tool. Um, so is there like a database or something behind that thing so that I can get the data from Oh, it? absolutely, yes. OK, so I need a database, I need a SAN, I need a terabyte of memory. And then um, who decides, because obviously that's going to be bigger probably than my database, who decides which subsets of data go into that BI tool's memory? Uh, somebody else. OK. So basically we have the same ar architecture we had before, but now it's got memory. It's memory. It's in memory. Yes, OK. I'm trying to figure out why I would want this thing. <laughs> It is no doubt true that underneath most of the disruptive shiny objects, there is some kind of fundamental change in the economics of the underlying hardware. This is an area in which that is true. Memory prices are dropping. Many of you are considering for the first time in your professional careers, the use of solid state disk as opposed to rotational media to unclog the bottlenecks in your database. There is a case to be made for in memory for some kinds of technologies, particularly BI tools. But often what in memory is is code on the supplier side for my product won't perform effectively unless it can run in memory. And that translates into very little other than cost for you to deploy it. One of the really hot things in the market is data visualization or advanced data visualization in particular, data discovery, data exploration. We're labeling a lot of different things. And it's great stuff because we're trying to take a bunch of raw numbers, tables of numbers, which we stare at and glass over, and turn them into visual encodings that our brain naturally uses. Because our brain is great at interpreting spatial arrangements of data, or just anything, and seeing relationships based on colors and shapes and sizes and relationships and connections. And you can perceive at a glance a lot of complex things and a lot of variables rather than trying to sit there and go through sets of numbers. And this is actually extending far beyond you know, a simple pie chart or a bar chart, but into big data territory. Because in that territory, you've got exceedingly large data sets, large and complex data sets. In order to pull out information from those large data sets, you've got a couple of choices. You can look at the data, or you can generate visual encodings of the data and then look at the data. And that will help you to perceive those relationships, because really, the only way that you're going to see through the complexity of all of that stuff is through visualization and techniques that allow you to explore that data. And now with things like cloud, which allows you to dynamically scale up and have in-memory architectures to give you the performance that you need to do this kind of beautiful stuff that just immediately gives you insight. Um, a whole new category of software has evolved, and that is this data visualization or discovery or exploration. And so um, really, that's the next wave of BI. That sounds like something I'd want. So I, I, I think that's a very beautiful picture there. Yes, it is. I did and it myself. I, I gather from the picture that it has something to do with Fukushima in Japan, so I'm presuming that that data is, is related to the, the nuclear accident that occurred there. Would that be accurate? Oh, yeah, absolutely. What does it mean? Have you seen the movie Stargate? Yes. Or the TV show with MacGyver. The, the pyramids <laughs> represent the aliens that caused the Fukushima accident. Oh. <laughs> I think. Actually, uh, the problem is that the legend got cut off on there. But, but you know, you can actually look at this, and you can, you can still interpret it, right? Because you can see that the pyramids are of different colors. Yes. And, and red usually means bad. Um, and they're very uh, big red ones. Big red ones, And yep. then small Big red ones, ones must be bad. 
Yes. Those are the bad aliens. Yeah. Oh, wait, no, no, um, sorry. Uh, Asia, generally red, auspicious oh, color. Oh, good luck. Sorry, sorry those right, are good. Got it. Uh, the blue ones are the bad the ones. The blue ones, okay. Um, and then, then, of course, the size represents less of something than the other things. And so since we're talking goodness, the good stuff must be clean in the red and radioactive in the blue. It makes perfect sense. I know. If you've, if you've looked at, the, at advanced data visualization, one of the things that you might have taken away is that it requires an incredible fluency that there's a reason why we have had bar, pi, and line charts since the 1890s, and that is that the literacy level required to interpret them is very low. A 14-year-old can make sense out of it. Uh, the advanced visualization market today is driven primarily by aesthetics and the capabilities of the rendering platform, which produces things like this beautiful to look at, impossible to interpret. Without the legend, which by the way, this particular graphic, which I pulled off the internet, did not bother to provide. So let's break character a little bit. Let's talk about the shiniest object there is, at least for Americans. The right to privacy and the right to be free from unlawful search and seizure is embedded in our fundamental philosophical infrastructure, is it not? And yet it's astounding to me, and I think to Mark as well, that while the rest of the world is quite rightly up in arms about what's happening with the collection of information from the nascent Internet of Things and our email and our telephone conversations, Americans appear to be largely unconcerned about this. Why is that? Money. Money? That's what I think. Tell me so more. We can make money off of all of this data. And all of this data that we're generating, and all of our companies are doing it, and all of our even political organizations, charities, are spinning off data from the automation infrastructure that we've built, as well as the social sharing and communications infrastructure. Data, data everywhere, and so we're figuring out ways to make more and more use of that data. Now, one of the points that we want to make is that certain things are not attributes that you build into a product or a piece of software. Oh. They are fundamental to the design of a system or an architecture. And things like security or privacy or we've referred to before performance do not come by buying a performance module or a security module and installing it in your product. The, uh, the arrangement of components and the interactions of those components generate emergent behaviors. And you can design that infrastructure in a way that permits certain things and doesn't permit others. And that infrastructure isn't just code. It's the arrangement of the different pieces of that code, and it's also the legal frameworks that exist around this. One of the things that most of us probably don't worry about, I do because I sometimes work with open data and government data, is the licensing of data as if it were code. So people have tried to put open licenses on data, treating them as if they were open licenses for code. But code and data are two very distinct and discrete things, and there is not a good parity on this. And when you read those terms of service on a thing like an iTunes agreement or your Gmail account, which is selling advertising against words in your email, these things can provide data leakage, which is inherent in the system of the web. What you don't realize is that when you see certain things, an image comes from some other place, and data has to go there, and then the images come back, the advertisements. And whenever that happens, there is the potential for data leakage about you, about your habits, about anything. And the same is true of devices. And Mark's example of the NSA is a perfect one. We aren't collecting data, we're collecting metadata. It's not the substance of your conversation, it's who you talked to, when you talked to them, and for how long you talked to them. And then maybe if we get a warrant, what you talked about. 
And that is inherent in the system and the arrangement of components and what it allows. And the only way that you're going to get the things that you care about, be it performance, privacy, security, or anything else, is to reason at a level of the architecture of this stuff, which is the components, just like a data warehouse has components. You have to think about how the parts work. Yes, and this more than anything else. The reason why we do not have either is because we designed for neither. And this is not just true of the infrastructure the NSA is interested in. One of the largest botnets in the world runs on retail point of sale devices. Sometime in the next 72 hours, some of you will have your credit card information taken by this botnet and whisked off into the gray economy where before the fraud people at your credit card bureau can catch it, you, you will be a party to transactions about which you know nothing, but the NSA will know. We could have talked about some other stuff, no upfront design, the failing notions of franchise technology, the terrible idea that maybe the next desktop architecture isn't owned by Microsoft, the whole notion of self-service BI, of social CRM, of agility, and then of course NoSQL and what we used to call big data, but I think within the next year we'll be calling fast data because big data is not cool anymore. But we picked the ones that we thought were most relevant for an emerging technologies conference. Antidotes in an age of hypermarketeering because you all need to be inoculated. Shiny is as shiny does, not as shiny looks. I bought that necklace for Gina Tyson based on how it looked. And what it did was turn her neck green and lose me the most beautiful girl in the world. You should be deconstructing every single claim made by every single vendor whose technology you intend to incorporate into your architectures. Absent evidence is evidence of absence. Strike out every adjective in every piece of collateral and on every web page. Run this experiment, run in the next 24 hours. Pick a technology you like, pull a piece of the collateral, strike out the adjectives and see what's left. In many cases, the answer will be not much. And what he's really talking about in these first couple of points is the art of propaganda deconstruction. If you really want to learn how to do some of this stuff, it actually is, is kind of fun to go out and look at the tools that people who do that sort of thing, political scientists, ethnographers, what they use to deconstruct propaganda. Because propaganda carries a message. There's an agency behind it that's trying to get you to do something, to persuade you. And all of this marketing exists for one of two reasons. It's either generating noise to hide something by labeling it with something, right? Because if you stick this label on there, well, then obviously this is a mobile BI tool. I thought this was, you know, my BI franchise vendor of choice, now new and improved with mobile. And what they're doing is they're hiding the fact that it's the same old schlock, but it's got a new label on it that allows it to now have this or be imbued with this new characteristic. And this stuff is noise injection. But the noise itself tells you something. It tells you where to look and start sniffing when you see these new adjectives being applied to stuff. Or it tells you what their dreams are. Whenever a new version of a product comes out with this new label on it, like in memory is a great example, there are vendors who are out there who suddenly are in memory vendors, but they haven't released a new version of their product. And so the real question is, what's different? What did you add? How is this now some new thing? They're using the propaganda principles here to defer your questions because it's obvious that it's now in memory. And so you would be stupid to ask this question. And so the way that you get around it is that you ask the obvious questions. Here are two shiny objects to close with. Let's talk about the octocopter. Brilliant bit of propaganda from Amazon. Not only were they able to create it and deploy it, but they conned 60 Minutes, arguably the most reputable journalistic operation in the United States today, into being the vehicle for the propaganda. 
Go and read the news stories in which the 60 Minutes producer said, oh my God, we were so excited. Amazon promised us something new and interesting and they wouldn't tell us what it was until the last minute and then we went live with it. Con job. And they asked them, how soon can you have 30 minute delivery of everything? They said, oh, we're all ready. All it takes is we need to have a few conversations with the FAA. I just want everybody to imagine for a minute what airspace is going to look like, right? And how long that process is going to take. They aren't interested in 30 minute delivery. They're interested in keeping you focused on that thing. Same thing with Bitcoin, right? Who's read something about Bitcoin in the last 72 hours? Here's the truth about Bitcoin. It is absolutely useless without the system of fiat money we enjoy today because until you can pay for everything with Bitcoins, Bitcoins are nothing but a private currency that has to be translated into the fiat money that all of us use today. Right? Unless you're a financial speculator, and I'm sure some of you are, it's just a distraction. And that's our shtick. You've been very patient. Thank you.